Okay, so the reason we actually ran this class is because my partner Lundori was very keen on improving our Spanish garb to take it so that we were running it from the skin out. So in order to do that, we actually had to look up and try and work out 16th century Spanish underwear and how that worked around the period of 1600. So the idea is what's worn under Venetians, breeches and gowns around 1600. Because of the way these things were done, it'll straddle between about 1580 through till about 1630 are the instruments we'll be looking at. So we're interested in Spanish braggers and of course the Italian braccia as well for both men and women. So because we didn't know a great deal about it and we had to do some exploring and some looking around, this is what we found. Okay, so the topics for the day will cover everything from the extant sources and the historical references through to patterns, construction, what materials you'll need and the finished, finished product. So at the end of the day, you can go right from these are the sources through to this is what I've made. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to be looking at extant examples that we've found. Also, historical references, various paintings, writings at the time, and modern interpretations from various sources as well. Okay, the best sources are, of course, extant sources. Burial garments are very good for that. The reason there aren't a great many extant examples of 1600 Bragas is primarily because they were worn to dissolution. You wore them till they fell apart and then you got new ones. Cloth was expensive. They weren't something you could just discard on a whim. Not only was it expensive, but because they were the undergarment, there was a lot of bodily contact. They dissolved much less than 400 years. Okay. Also, the clothes, were, undergarments weren't always listed in inventories of clothing. Oh. Drawers were sometimes left out. I was a little concerned at the start that the garments I was looking at were Italian primarily and from the Netherlands. But upon reflection, that's not a major concern. There was a lot of intermingling of fashion between the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Spain. So things that were worn in those countries would also reflect those worn in Spain at the same time. Especially when you think about the fact that the purpose of the undergarments is the same no matter which country you're from. So it doesn't really matter in that area as long as they're that European style of clothing, it will be reflected in Spanish underwear as well. We're also going to be talking about men's and women's undergarment. We're going to show extent examples of both. There are some where the curator or the person examining wasn't entirely sure, but it became apparent later on which were the male or female garments. Okay, this is the first extent example I want to talk about. This is the garment of a Sicilian lady in patterns of fashion. Janet Arnold references it as possibly that of a man, but then later on in the, the book, she decides that it's actually probably more likely that of a woman. The important things to note are that they're linen drawers. They're a very fine, high quality linen made around 1600. There's a good weave, it's closely woven. You can see there's a band of embroidery at the base of each leg. If you drill in close to the photos, you can see that there are run and fell seams and it's closed with a drawstring at the top. The next one, again, these are Italian linen drawers of a woman around 1600. Again, very high quality, very fine white linen gathered into a waistband. In this one, you can very much see that the level of the gathering and the drawing in from the hips. The waistband is a, is a heavier linen for obvious reasons. Again, it's with a tie and with a waistband. The construction again is showing run and fell seams. Okay, this is a male example. 
These are the underpants of Hendrik Casimir I in the Netherlands. They're linen breeches around 1630 to 1640. Again, you can see they're clearly gathered into a waistband. There's clearly visible back stitching. There are felled seams drawn together with a drawstring. In this one, it's different from the other two in that there are gauze on the outside of the lower leg in both the cases. So this is a little different and we'll talk about why that would be a bit later. Okay, now we're going to talk about historical references in paintings and so on. Clearly, there weren't enough paintings around 1600 of people in their underwear, but you have to work with what you've got. The religious paintings and paintings of rural life were the two best sources I found of paintings of people in their underwear. For the rural life, it was mostly labourers, workers, things along those lines, and they were wearing the shorter braggers, the ones without the long leg, cut on the bias for stretch. The other thing we found was for the religious paintings, they weren't particularly accurate historically. They were reflecting in 1600 what they thought was being worn in the time of Christ and the saints. So you get a, a, a mixture of pretend imagined historical images, what they thought would be the case, and what was worn around 1600. So you get a very mixed result for underwear interpretations in that period. Go to the next one. Okay, so we're looking at a transition period around 1600 where you've got they're changing from the shorter braggers, which they wore outside, through to the longer ones that were worn as under breeches or drawers or things along those lines, underneath a dress, underneath your breeches or your Venetians. Next one. We're also going to talk about etchings, which are a marvellous source of paintings for drawers. So we'll talk about several of those as well as we go through. Okay. On the left for this one, as you can see, you have a labourer. He's in his bragas. They're the short bragas. They're clearly cut on a bias. You can see by the stretch in the fabric. These are from 1442. On the right, you have a piece from the altarpiece of San Vincenzo. It's a very tight close-up. First half of the 16th century, these are the longer style brothers. Again, they don't go to over the knee in this case, but you can clearly see the drawstring and the tie at the front there. So if we go to the next one. Oh, now we're going to talk about the Italian etchings. There are a number of Italian etchings of Venetian courtesans from around 1590, 1600. The drawers were worn under dresses because they were warm, they were practical when they were riding. It was just a common sense thing to wear. But they were viewed, I found references that are viewed as immodest for good women not to wear them, but practicality meant they had them. For example, Eleanor of Toledo in the inventory of what she owned in 1574, there was a red taffeta set of drawers that she owned. These are a more robust garment than the ones we've been talking about up to now, probably lined by the look of them. In this case, you can see there is a slit at the knee to actually work around the problem of when the braggers go below the knee and you'd move, they tend to catch on the kneecap. So this is a solution around there. Okay, here is a second pair. Again, as you can see, they're patterned. They're more robust than the single layer of linen underlining. They have a button or possibly a knee decoration on the outside of the knee. This is 1591. And again, a Venetian courtesan, which reflects the idea that courtesans would wear drawers under their dresses. So the next one, 
these are some modern interpretations that we came across after doing the research on the paintings and the extent examples. So there are three we came across. There is Costim, which has some wonderful information. Margot Anderson has a bundle of undergarment patterns, the Italian ladies' underpinnings. They're very worthwhile as well. Some nice things. We'll actually show you an example based on one of those patterns a little later. Matthew Nagy also has a YouTube channel and a Patreon page. In his YouTube channel, he covers making underbreaches based on the Henry Casimir I pattern, including the use of the external gore for the bottom of each leg. So before we go on and talk about our interpretations, are there any questions? Okay, so we're going to work through our two interpretations. The first thing to talk about is the linen. We've used a heavier linen and that would have been used in 1600 Spain. The Elizabethan style of linen was extremely high quality, much higher quality than we would normally consider what we use today. Today, what we would consider a high quality linen appears to be mid range for what they would be doing. These are heavier linen, they are 15 ounce, oh, sorry, five ounce linen, not 15 ounce, as opposed to the one and a half or two ounce linen that would have been used at the time. I've circled in red the area because I've put pleats in there rather than gathering the front. That was mostly just due to timing. I've also circled the, the run and fell seam at the back, as you can see, for the construction. The next one, these are pat, pam, uh, breaches made by Lindore. These are based on the Margot Anderson pattern. As you can see, there has been some embroidery stretching down along the front. They're gathered into the waistband. Again, this is the five ounce linen, not the two or three ounce linen. So it's a, a coarser linen, but still about 50 threads to the inch. In the example we've got here, we actually didn't get time to put the knee bands on, but the rest of it is, is as per the construction. Okay, so to talk about the materials next, as I've mentioned, the linen they used at the time was a very fine light linen, very high thread count, 50, 60 threads per inch easily. A cambric linen, things along those lines. Depending on how robust you need linen to be, that isn't required. At the end of the presentation, I have links to linen purchases you can do with Burnley and Trowbridge, WM Booth Draper, things along those lines. Even fabricstore.com has some. The linen is sewn with a 60 slash 2 linen thread. It's a medium weight thread and it works quite well for what we were doing. We obviously wax the linen thread. There's a few reasons to wax linen thread. One is it helps with strength. Secondly, it helps keep it in place. And thirdly, it helps with the fraying when you're drawing the thread through. As you're doing multiple stitches and pulling through, the, the small fine pieces of the thread start to fray. The linen helps hold that in place and makes it less likely to break or wear through as it runs through. Obviously you need needles. Personally, I like a, a shorter, fatter quarters between, but whatever needle works for you is, is absolutely fine. And if you're using eyelets, some sort of a bone bodkin or something along those lines, just for pushing a thing in, don't, punch a grommet, use a bodkin and actually use an eyelet. The grommets will wear through and fray and damage the fabric. The bodkin will ease or open the hole and when you whip stitch it for your eyelet, you get a much more reliable long-term eyelet. Next okay, so this is the first pattern that we did. This is one that we put together ourselves. Later on, we experimented with Margot Anderson and the Matthew Nagy patterns, but this was the first one we came up with. The circle in green is to reflect the fact that it's higher at the waist, at the back. 
this is a modern interpretation for comfort. I found that when we built the first few pairs, when we didn't raise the back, you had a very awkward crack or gap at, at your back center. So bringing it up about five centimeters helped remove that, which makes them more comfortable to wear. The paintings that we looked at and the extent examples have different lengths. So depending on what length you want is how you can adjust that. You can have them from the short leg all the way down to well below the knee, depending on what's comfortable for you and what you're wearing over them. Okay, so the first measurement you need is your waist measurement. Now this is your true waist, not your modern waist. So when you're flexing from side to side, this is where you measure from around there, around your waist. For some people, the bend of your elbow, if you can bend your elbow and look at where that is, that should be approximately where your true waist is. That's not the same for everyone. I know for Lodore and myself, neither of us it works, but for a lot of people it does. So work out where it is and that's what meant you're measuring. Now, once you've got that measurement, you add seam allowance, you add how much of an overlap you want. This is your length for your waistband. We made the waistband six centimeters high because you've got to allow for the seam allowance and for folding it in half. So because you saw that the braggers are very gathered around the waist, we took the number that was the waist measurement and we added 50 to 75% of that. And that's the waist measurement for each half of your pattern so that you can get a good amount of gathering going on. Okay, crotch length is, as you can see, it's from your center waist through under your crotch and back up to your waist again. Make sure you draft the craft crotch length that's appropriate for yourself. Getting it a little long is much better than getting it a little short. A little short, you get very strange pulls and it's, it, it doesn't sit right at all. I found a French curve was very useful for getting that curve and that shape right. And a, a bit of a modern point, if you can try and get a right angle at the two crotch points, the assembly is much easier down the track. Okay, your leg circumference is where you want the braggers to sit on your lower leg, whether it's your thigh or below your knee or whatever you choose. Don't forget to add seam allowance. This is then the length of your leg band. We made the leg band four centimeters, again, because you're halving it and you've got seam allowance as well. You don't need a very large leg band. We chose in this not to add gauze. We found that as long as you've got some fullness in the pattern and it sits comfortably and doesn't bind, we didn't find gauze when needed. Gauze seemed to be something you would add if you found that the leg needs a bit more gap or a bit more fullness, or you're changing shape over time. Because these were worn to the point where they broke down, that would last for several years. If your shape changed and you needed a little bit more fullness there, you could pop a gore in the lower leg. Okay, the final measurement is your inside seam. So if your leg length passes below the knee, don't forget to measure that with your leg bent because you'll need to make allowances for slipping below the knee and fullness there. Next one. There's a question about handouts. Hello, there's a question about handouts. We don't have a separate handout, but the PowerPoint itself is available. And these number, these information is actually in the this in here. So we don't have a separate handout. We we based it all on the one PowerPoint. Okay, so now we want to talk about the construction techniques. There's obviously a great deal. The first pair we looked at, the pair that I made were hand sewn. The pair from Margot Anderson were machine sewn, simply for speed of getting them ready for this class. Okay, next part. 
Okay, so back stitching is what we've done for all the seams. The seams are all back stitched to give them a far more robust rather than a whip or a running stitch. There's run and fill seams. All the seams are enclosed, so there's no edges to fray. And again, a run and fill seam is very strong and will last a long time. Being underwear, you want these to be able to last for a long time. So there we go. Okay, and final whip stitching for putting on the leg bands and the waistband. Also, one of the things that they did is if you're comfortable with your stitching and your stitching you, you're quite pleased with, use colored thread, make it a decorative stitch so you can do the waistband or even the run and fell seams with a colored thread. You can also put a decorative stitch as you saw or embroidery around the bottom of the legs, around the crotch, whatever you, you want. That's quite appropriate to do them in a decorative manner. Okay, a couple of tips from what we found. Calico mock-ups are great. Okay, so calico mock-ups are great. We used several, we test, we do the gathering, we find out how it works, change it again, another one. The other thing to emphasize is the incredible use of the iron. When I'm sewing linen, I find the iron is really useful. Making sure that when you're doing a run and fell seam, pressing the seam, then doing the fold, pressing it again with the iron. The more you use the iron, the more effective it is. Linen loves to be pressed and ironed. It holds that seam really well. Okay. If you're not sure about whip stitching, run and fell, back stitching, running stitch, any of these, there are two sites on YouTube I would very happily recommend, The Sinister Sewist and Morgan Donna. Both are really good references for finding out on hand stitching and a lot of other things that they do as well. Be aware The Sinister Sewist is left-handed, so you will have to flip some of those things in your head as you're watching, but her skills are great. It's really worth looking at these two people. Okay, we're now going to work through just quickly the construction steps. It's a straightforward process. We go to the next part. The first part is you obviously cut two bodies, the waistband and two leg bands using the measurements that you've worked out earlier. Okay. You then sew the center back seam from the waist down to the crotch. After that, I then sew the center front up to the point at the crotch where it opens. I then hem the two center front openings up to the waist. So at that point, you have a circle that goes from the center back all the way through to the center front, and that's sewn. So I then do the same with the inner legs, working up both inner legs till it gets to the crotch as well. So you now have all the seams sewn as an initial back stitch. I then fell all the seams. The reason I leave the felling to the very end is because you've got the seams that run from front to back and seams that run from right to left. So in order to make sure that they all sit right, I do all the felling at the end, just to tidy that up and make sure it all sits correctly. Okay, you then gather the waistband and the you gather the waist and attach that to the waistband using a whip stitch for the front and back. Then once that's done, you work out the waist closure. You put through a drawstring, you do eyelets, you do buttons, you do whatever works for yourself to get that to work. Then once that's on and you're comfortable with all of that and it all sits correctly, then you do the leg band and the leg seam and work out the length for that that you want. Doing the leg at the very end is just easier because it sits, you've got the drape going and it, it's just an easier way of doing things. Okay, are there any questions? 
Any question I have is uh, somebody was asking what we mean by calico, and it's been answered in the chat by another identifying that muslin is how they identify what we know as calico. Yes. That's the only question I have. Excellent. In that case, I appear to have talked way too fast, to which I do apologize. Ah, there is another question. Oh, there is another question. What sort of drawstring would be appropriate? I don't actually know, to be really honest. I haven't looked into that. Um, I used buttons on mine. Braided cord, I would imagine, would be the correct thing. Mm. You could finger even loop. do something with finger loop braiding. Do a, a five or a seven strand finger loop braid. That would be absolutely great. Okay, now we might just quickly go on to the links. Okay, so these are the references. We've got some source web pages, uh, Elizabethan Costume and Realm of Venus, which are, are wonderful sources, not just on ragas or drawers, but on all sorts of things. They're, they're great. We've linked to the Sinister Sowist and Morgan Donna. Also, the references to what I talked about earlier with Margot Anderson, Matthew Nagy and Costim. Very useful resources, again, not just for braggers, but for all layers of Spanish clothing, from doublets through to dresses to, to all of it. I've also popped in some suppliers. They're not necessarily the best suppliers. They're just the suppliers that I have used for various things. Burnley and Trowbridge, I find, are very useful for a, an extra fine linen. They also have a large amount of sewing notions. They have linen thread, uh, all sorts of things on those lines. WM Booth Draper is also very good for linen. And if you're looking for something a little less robust or more robust rather, Fabric Store is also very, very good. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and of course, you need linen thread. Because you have a little bit of extra time, I might jump the screen back to Lindore's Bracus. I'll just take a moment to jump back and I'll talk a bit about why we made some decisions that we did on that. There we go. As you can see, Lindore's braggers are at the knee or slightly below. In fact, mine were much shorter. The reason that we made some of these decisions about the length of the knee is because Lindore and I are both fences. And when you wear undergarments that go below the knee and you gather them into a knee band or a leg band, it turns out that when you're doing lunging or large steps, it actually catches on the kneecap. And tugs and tears and there's all sorts of bad things so be aware of that so we made ours primarily to sit just above the knee so that if they're just above the knee you don't have that problem of them catching on the kneecap it was an athletics thing rather than a in period design thing okay are they comfortable to wear is the question yes they're actually very comfortable to wear we've made the first pair back in March and wore them to a few events. Thankfully in Lockhart, we've had events starting up again now, which is wonderful. So we've actually managed to come out in garb for some events and they work well. I wear Italian Venetians, mostly rather than the Trunkos and Canyons. And for the Venetians, they're lovely. They work really well, they're very comfortable. Mine are a bit plain. Lindore is working on embroidery on hers and it looks great. So well worth doing. If you, if you want that little bit of an extra layer, it might be a bit obsessive, but I'm comfortable with that, to be honest. So that way, all the way through from the skin out is as authentic as possible. There's... Um... Uh, somebody in the chat has um, provided a US reference in regards to linen. I'm not entirely sure whether we have access to that, which is Dharma Trading Company. 
Oh, great. Another source of linen. Thank you. Yeah. That's Apparently really good. Budget price, but whether that's budget price for us who are not in Australia. Mm. One of the challenges we have down in, in Lockhart in Australia is it's not just the cost of the linen, it's the cost of shipping the linen. You might buy linen that costs you $30, but the shipping will be $50. So when it becomes a trade-off, I tend to find that personally, I tend to go for higher quality, finer linen because more of the cost is in the shipping than the linen anyway. So it's, it's worth the extra effort from down here. If you're in the US, shipping is going to be just a matter of dollars. So it becomes a very different field. All right, now we'll jump on to the recommended books. These are the books I used for my, my exploration of what was appropriate. Patterns of Fashion, one through five. I cannot recommend them enough for obvious reasons. Patterns of Fashion 4 was very useful for the undergarments. It had the two examples I showed broken out step by step, the full layout, fabulous document. Modera Forenza was really useful for the things on Eleanor of Toledo. What was in her wardrobe, what they found there, really good. Uh, La Moda and La Sociedad Aragoncia de Siglo XVI was good for finding out references to Bragas at the time in Aragon. Whether there are references, wardrobes, people had things along those lines. Again, Hispanic costume stops before my time, so it wasn't that useful, but it still had some interesting references to the extension of legs in Bragas and Brache. The others are all fairly self-explanatory as you go through. The only one I would put a caveat on is the history of underclothes by C. Willett and Phyllis Cunnington. Really interesting book, but it was written in the 1950s. So there has been things discovered in the last 70 years that may have an impact on that. Really worth reading, but be aware it is 70 years old. So that's just for some context. Okay, can I stop sharing? Yes. There's a question in regards to um, the unfinished garments that are the ones that I've made. Yeah. In regards to whether they would have leg bands and whether the leg bands would indeed be gathered. Um, according to the descriptions I've got, they won't be gathered. Um, and I have started just hemming them, but I may or may not put a band upon them, but they wouldn't be gathered. They would probably catch if they were gathered. I'd need to make them fall. Yes. The extant examples, there is a slight gather on some of them, but some of them, as you can see, had embroidered legs, and so there was no gathering on those. It was just folded up. Everything to just the next image. Yeah. Just these ones that are obviously made by the fabrics. Yes. These are the drawers we were talking about with the Venetian courtesans. And it's worth mentioning again that these are different from the undergarments we were talking about. These are the ones that are viewed as immodest. They're probably multiple layers. They've got an outer fabric and they go to the knee. So, all right, if there's nothing else. I'm just going to take uh, a stop sharing screen. Okay. Okay. Um, Stop share, so you're on. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay, if there are no other questions, I will actually give you some time back because it turns out I'm a little early. All right, 